The Vivian G. Harsh Research Collection of Afro-American History and Literature is a compendium of papers, rare books, artifacts, photos, and documents preserved for future generations. Second only to the Schomburg Collection in New York City, it is the largest collection of African American history and literature in the Midwest, with over 75,000 books, 15,000 reels of microfilm, 4,000 clipping files, and 175 manuscripts and archival collections. While the collection includes some materials on African Americans throughout the diaspora, the primary focus is on African American history in Chicago and Illinois. Among its holdings are the papers of the Abbott Senstack family, Barbara E. Allen, Timuel D. Black Jr., Edda Moulton Barnett, Earl B. Dickerson, Francis Minor, and the Chicago SNCC History Project Archives. Vivian Gordon Harsh was born in 1890 to a prominent Black Chicago family. She graduated from Wendell Phillips High School and later from Simmons College in Boston with a degree in library science. A vivid account of her life and times is provided by Cynthia Fife Townsell, a current librarian at the Harsh, in her blog, Vivian G. Harsh, Librarian of the Chicago Black Renaissance. In January 1932, the George Cleveland Hall branch of the Chicago Public Library opened at 48th Street and Michigan Avenue in Chicago's Bronzeville neighborhood, launching an era that would later become to be known as the Chicago Black Renaissance. Good morning. Welcome to the Harsh Research Collection. We are located in the Woodson Regional Library on 9525 South Halstead. The Harsh Research Collection is named in honor of Vivian Gordon Harsh, who was the founder of the collection in 1932. She started off at the George Cleveland Hall Library, located at 48th and Michigan. The library opened January 18, 1932, in the heart of Bronzeville, which was the area where most of the blacks were migrating from the south lived in. To the other side of me are pictures of Carter G. Woodson, who is known as the father of Negro history, and Charlemagne Hill Rollins, who was a children's librarian at the George Cleveland Hall branch. Vivian Harsh was given a grant from Julius Rosenwald to go around this country and find out what made a special Negro history collection. And she started off at the Schomburg Collection in New York so that she could fine tune the points of what she needed to create a similar collection in Chicago. She came back to Chicago and her passion was ignited. She was going to start her own special Negro history collection, which she did. She opened up the doors to the community. She opened up the doors to social leaders. She opened up the doors to doctors and lawyers and morticians and more important, writers from the Harlem, from the Chicago Renaissance utilized the George Cleveland Hall branch when the Illinois Writers Project was created under FDR's New, Bill, New Deal in 1939. At its helm, Vivian Harsh was determined to build an institution that was responsive and respectful of its community. Over time and with keen insight, Harsh collected rare books, pamphlets, and materials that documented the African American experience. Funding for the Special Negro Collection, as it came to be called, came from grants and patron donations, as well as Harsh's own pocket. In the 1930s, the collection's reputation spread and the library became a meeting place for black writers, artists, and activists. When the WPA's Federal Writers Project was shut down, the director of the Negro in Illinois project donated over a hundred boxes of research materials to Harsh. Langston Hughes donated the manuscripts and galley proofs for his biography, The Big C. Scholars and neighborhood folk mingled at the bi-monthly book review and lecture forum, which hosted such speakers as Richard Wright, Zora Neale Hurston, Gwendolyn Brooks, Elaine Locke, Horace Caton, and St. Clair Drake. 
The collection was a success and grew into one of the largest collections of African American literature and history in the United States. This woman of extraordinary vision, the city's first black librarian, passed away in August 1960. In 1970, her special Negro collection was renamed the Vivian G. Harsh Research Collection of Afro-American History and Literature. Good afternoon. Thank you for joining me today in the Chicago Public Library's Vivian G. Harsh Research Collection of Afro-American History and Literature. This is the largest collection of African-American history and literature in the Midwest, the second in the United States after New York Public Library Schomburg Research Collection. Right behind me is our reference desk. This is the point of contact when you are getting in touch with any of the staff here at the Harsh Research Collection. We consist of two archivists and two librarians. At the moment, due to the pandemic, we're asking all researchers to make an appointment online before you want to come in to view any of our 240 archival collections, our large, extensive uh, reference book collection, our collections on microfilm, and our subject and biographical research files. Once you've made that appointment, you'll come in here and we'll help you at our reference desk. We'll get you all set up. There are a few forms you're going to have to fill out and then you can go ahead and grab a seat in our manuscript reading room. And this is a special room because as an archivist's job, we try to make sure that the collections are safe, that they are preserved and secure, and two, we want to grant access to this history that we have here at the Harsh Research Collection. So gaining access and providing access may include a research visit. You might want to go online to the Chicago Public Library. We have digitized some of our archival collections and put those online. Just recently, we digitized the papers of Dr. Tim Ewell Black, so you can read his World War II correspondence and his speeches. Other collections that are included include the Chicago Renaissance, uh, the Philip Sang papers, uh, the papers of the Hall Branch, which is where our collection started. Uh, we also have numerous events online, including the Patricia Lydell Researchers Group. That group meets via Zoom on the fourth Saturday of every month, and they specialize in African American genealogy. So really, there's a wide variety of ways that you can interact with the Harsh Research Collection and support us, and we greatly appreciate your support. In 1994, a group of scholars, professionals, and community activists formed a committee to investigate what had happened to funds allocated by the Build Illinois program to purchase land to house the Vivian G. Harsh Research Collection. Aware of the poor state of the collection, they were deeply concerned that this archive of Afro-American literature, art, and historical documents would not survive. More than 20 strong, the committee petitioned city officials to invest the promised funds to build a new space for the Vivian G. Harsh Collection at the Woodson Regional Library. The press, particularly the Chicago Defender, adopted the issue and sparked community and city-wide support. The committee officially became the Society for the Advancement of the Vivian G. Harsh Research Collection of Afro-American History and Literature. In 1995, city and state officials announced a $3.5 million renovation project to expand and update the building housing, the Harsh Collection. In 1999, the new home of the Vivian G. Harsh Collection opened with a permanent exhibit gallery, expanded reading room, and preservation facilities. Renamed the Vivian G. Harsh Society Incorporated, the organization is a 501c3 not-for-profit that supports the same mission as the founding 1994 committee to preserve, expand, and promote the collection. The Society provides engaging events and outreach programs that keep Black history alive and accessible to the public. Programming, such as the Timuel D. Black Jr. Short-Term Fellowship and our Black Music Month celebration, help fulfill the Society's mission of promoting and preserving this powerful archive of Black history. In the words of Vivian Harsh, if we as Negroes knew the full truth about what we 
as a race have endured and overcome just to stay alive with dignity. Our respect and hunger for education would triple overnight. Respectfully, we submit that this full truth, this self-knowledge and understanding would help inspire our people to love and appreciate ourselves, to positively channel our energies and to achieve ever greater accomplishments. Hello, everybody. We're here at the Carter G. Woodson Library at the Vivian Harsh Research Collection. Thank you for joining the Vivian Harsh Society for the first virtual Black Music Month celebration. The theme of our program is the power of Black music. My name is Monica Faith Stewart, and I'm pleased to be your host. Today, we will celebrate by serving up an awesome, generous slice of a delicious black layer, black music cake with, with music across four genres, blues, hip hop, gospel, and jazz. To give you a taste of what is to come, the first layer is blues, represented by Chicago's own Fernando Jones. This world-class, internationally known American bluesman, band leader, and songwriter is an enthusiastic music educator dedicated to keeping the blues alive. The second layer of our musical cake is hip hop. Marcos Palacios, professionally known as Cosign, is a Grammy-nominated producer and artist. In high demand as a music producer, he has proven himself to be an exceptional, outstanding performance hip hop artist. The third layer is rooted in the faith and hope of the black experience in America. Gospel music is the good news that renews, encourages, and uplifts us. Master vocalist Sankara Haruna delivers a true soul-stirring musical performance. Our fourth layer is jazz. No way can you celebrate black music without jazz. Audley Reed is an outstanding contemporary Chicago jazz artist who began his musical odyssey over 25 years ago. Proficient on all saxophones, Reed prefers the alto sax. His passionate technique, smooth styling, and distinctive sound has made him a favorite of jazz enthusiasts. His talent is often compared to the, that of the all-time greats. The icing on our four-layer cake is poetry. Formerly senior editor for Third World Press, Gwendolyn Mitchell is the author of, the po of a poetry collection, House of Women, and co-editor of two anthologies, Releasing the Spirit and Describing the Moment. She will recite her poem, The Power of Black Music. We hope that you will enjoy today's celebration of Black music, the melodies of our hopes and dreams, the sound of our tears and fears, the angry anthems of protests and demands, our expressions of faith, hope, and love. American music would be nothing without Black music. Today, our musical artist will preface each performance with his individual take on our theme, The Power of Black Music. We will begin with a brief discussion on this topic with our special guest, June Moon. Hi, welcome June, thanks for coming. Thanks for having me, Monica, great to be here. It's a pleasure. June knows the music industry inside and out. He has an uncanny ability to forecast and identify new trends in music, technology, and entertainment. His company, IamMusicOnline.com, is a digital content supplier for streaming companies like 
iTunes, Apple Music, and Spotify. A professional musician, longtime record executive, and music producer. In his career, he's worked with a long line of stars. Names like the Staple Singers, Count Basie, Paul Simon, Andre Crouch, Janet Jackson, Sting, Prince, Al Green, Dr. Dre are among those listed on his profile. But enough name calling. June, we're happy to have you. And let's get started. We want to hear from you. Let's go. Now, Maya Angelou once said that Black music is the hero sheroes of the African-American experience. In the context of our history, how do you describe the power of Black music? Black music is the foundation and has been. Um, before they brought us over here, we had the drums. When they brought us over here, they took away the drums because they knew how powerful mm. that was, a medium. And then that just forced us to create alternative music styles um, using our voice, using all kinds of other instruments that we created to proliferate the power of Black music. But Monica, it's not just Black music. The music that we created is the music that this country's foundations were built on. Because whenever they tried to stop us, we just did something new. And then they would copy what we did. Until this day, um, they're still doing that but we still keep inventing and reinventing with the foundation always being the rhythm and the drum. So black music is, is the foundation mm -hmm. of our existence and of this country's existence. Mm. When we just talk about the power of black music, we are generally referring to power as a positive force, mm -hmm. affirming, constructive, uplifting. Mm -hmm. We refer to the power of Black music as an enabler, conferring in us the strength and ability to keep on keeping on, mm -hmm. the energy to overcome adversity and to achieve and accomplish despite all odds. However, you have voiced some recent reservations about the power, about the power of music. And it's used by some time in some types of black music today. And I wanted to ask you, and you've also questioned uh, how this plays out in our communities mm -hmm. today. And I wanted to ask you to please uh, comment on these kind of, and share with us these kind of your reservations or the. Again, black music yeah. has always helped us and been the force to help us transition through all the difficulties and all the celebrations that we've had. Um, rhythm being the main just of what the catalyst of that music was the beat. And, you know, the message has changed. The message has changed as to be appropriate with the movement or whatever we needed or whatever we were trying to say. I mean, going back to slavery again, when we were, you know, the messages got us through the, got us to and through the Underground Railroad got us to our freedom, and we celebrated with the music. Um, we still have a lot of the music, um, but the message, the message is through hip hop. And uh, I can't just say rap because rap music, the foundation of that, there were also messages, and there are good messages in hip hop. Um, but that beat and that rhythm coming back from the motherland, in the motherland, it, it, it was mostly used to convey um, times of war and to excite the warriors and to get them riled up so they could fight. And in doing my research, Monica, I mm -hmm. see that, you know, as much as I am, I'm really down on a lot of these messages. It's just not necessary. And the messages don't really help advance us anymore. Um, they say that they reflect this generation. Well, they really don't because the majority of the generation is very, uh, uh, Process, uh, positive and moving forward. But I think, again, um, 
the, the people, the man, the white folks have also really helped re-engineer um, those messages to be detrimental to us, to teach us things that we, you know, they say it's our experience. Well, not necessarily, but, you know, a lot of people, a lot of the young people today mimic what they hear in the music, and that's not good because of what they hear in the music is not positive. Um, again, in the, in the old days, I'm um, talking about the way old days in, 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 in slavery, emancipation, and, and um, the movements, all the movements, white and black civil rights movements, the music was always used to carry and proliferate the message. And right now, that message is not a good one. And um, the music is still there, and the beat, just like in Homeland in Africa, the beat still moves us and gets our hearts pumping and gets us excited. But when you listen for a message, the good news, it's not always there anymore. So I, I have problems with that. I think it's going to change, but I have problems with it now. I know. Um, I sense also what you're saying is that that sometimes this message and therefore and the music that delivers the message is a backdrop for what we are experiencing in terms of like the gun violence and violence in mm -hmm. our in our com um, communities. And it reminds me of how, um, of something Martin Luther King once said, uh, hate cannot drive, a uh, darkness cannot drive out hate. Only light can do that. Mm -hmm. Hate can't drive out hate. Only love can do that. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's the um, element of black music that has been positive has helped us Absolutely. keep going. Absolutely. And um, I want to share with everybody that June is also a dad. Last Sunday was Father's Day and he's a proud father of five. And one of his sons is Joshua, a gifted pianist who, is, who at the tender age of 18 has already traveled the world and has won every music competition he's ever enrolled in. So talk to us a bit about the power of love. Hmm. It's interesting. We've traveled um, um, around the world um, as him being a kid from the time that he was eight years old until now he's 18 and playing mostly classical music. But they always meet him where he is, which is he's a young black classical musician, musician, which you don't get, especially in Europe, which is where we mostly travel and he plays. They don't see that, but they know Monica. They know the basis of classical music and they know the roots. And Joshua is a fine um, young pianist and classically trained, but they come to see him and he fills all the terms around the world because they know that he's playing with soul. Okay, and they know it and they feel it because, you know, they were the ones who put us in this situation <laughs> to begin with. So th they know the truth and they know that it comes through him as it's, it's in our DNA, the rhythm uh, and the soul, literally the pain, the pleasure and everything that encompasses our experience in this country and back in our homeland. It comes through the music. So Joshua proliferates that when he plays mm. and people come and they feel him people come and cry because they feel I mean, I'm not fooled he's a great musician and artist but I know what they're feeling they're feeling our soul our struggle mm. the soul that colors and flavors Absolutely. everything that we do yes our food <laughs> our music <laughs> our love you know I, I thought for a minute I think about you know during the 60s each struggle we went through, it was all about conveying love and forgiveness. forgiveness. Mm. And it came to the music, the mm. Motown era. You know, even the early rap stuff, we talked about struggles, but, you know, right now, again, my problem is that, and this was the original question, is that we're not talking about the struggles. We're talking about creating Ang anger. anger. Okay, and pain. Mm. Which ain't gonna go away, but well, we don't have to talk about it. We don't have to put it in every song that we sing now. Well, then we have to shine our light. Absolutely. And share our love. Yes. 
Listen, June, thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you it, for having me. I really appreciate it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, oh, now we're going to our first performance. Fernando Jones. He started playing the blues on the guitar when he was just four years old. He's a founding member of the Blues Ensemble at Columbia College and a faculty member there in the music department. Founder of Blues Kids Foundation, 10 years ago, Fernando established Blues Kids Camps that offers budding blues musicians an immersive blues experience. Here is Fernando Jones on what the power of the blues means to him and later he will perform me. Welcome to June, welcome to Black Music Month. I am music and I am black. June is Black Music Month. Black music has shaped the world we live in. It has recorded the goings on. It has been the song of protests. It has been the song of freedom, love, joy, mistrust, skepticism, and of course, it has reflected life. The blues was created here in America. However, it has strong West African roots, undeniable. And from the blues comes gospel, jazz, and even rock and roll hip-hop, house, funk, and don't forget, 70s soul. This is what black music is to me. I started playing music at a very, very early age, influenced and impacted by my older brothers. Now, as a child, all I ever wanted to do was play the blues. That was kind of the family business. My older brothers played me being the baby brother, and some of you all who are baby brothers or baby sisters kind of understand the attraction of wanting to be with and being like your older brothers or older sisters. So, carrying that, uh, I guess that desire to play music with me from four years old all the way up until the present, and actually carrying it to my adulthood about 30 years ago, created a program called Blues Kids of America. And the purpose of Blues Kids of America was a, uh, is a multicultural, interdisciplinary arts and education music program. And since this is Black Music Month, we know that the blues is an indigenous African-American art form with strong West African influences and strong West African DNA. So, after about 20 years of Blues Kids of America, I created Blues Camp. Once again, through the lens of uh, the eyes of that four-year-old kid who wanted to be like, you got it, you guessed it, his big brothers and wanting to be with them. So, I created Blues Kids of America and established it uh, in Chicago Public Schools and then had an opportunity to do programs throughout the country. I established Blues Camp in 2010 on a college campus at Columbia College Chicago where I'm presently on faculty and am the founding Blues Ensemble director there. Um, decided to create a Blues Camp, a place where kids who wanted to play the blues could come and complain and be kids most of all. Kind of like how they do when they have jazz camps. Well, jazz camps are in abundance as well as classical music camps and things of that or genre, music genres as such. But it's not that much for blues, you know. It's, um, and, and I guess it goes across all strata, if you will, you know. There are a ton of books on jazz and very few on blues. And of the ones that are on blues, those few, even fewer of a percentage of them are written by uh, bona fide blues musicians or black musicians who are in the trenches. So, me feeling um, some sort of an obligation, being a blues kid, of 
course, and then being a, once upon a time ago and being a blues man, I just wanted to have an opportunity to give kids an opportunity who may have been like me, wanting to play and not necessarily having an organized place to play. So every summer we have a blues camp at Columbia College Chicago in different parts of the world. We've established them in Asia, in the Caribbean, in Europe, and uh, hopefully one day we'll be able to do something on the west coast of Africa. So at any point in time, if you are, if your kids are interested, they can always find out more about our blues camps that happen in the summer and our blues camp workshops that go on throughout the year at blueskids.com. And another cool thing about blues camp is it's always free for you and your blues kid to attend. As the founder of Blues Kids of America, Blues Kids Foundation, and Blues Camp, and Blues Camp International, I know how important black music is. I know how impactful black music can be. I know how influential black music can be. Now, I would like to share a performance of my band, which is called Fernando Jones and My Band. Every time I get stopped by the police I'm a thug I'm a thing, I'm a thief And my wife don't want me And my woman won't let her put me out My wife don't want There were two people in the race And nobody voted for me They wanted to raise taxes And I wanted world peace And my wife don't want me and my woman won't let her put me out My wife don't want me Juba, Juba, Jubilee shout, summertime lullabies that grew us up right from wrong. Go to sleep, children sleep, and smile with the rising sun. Our voices strain to be heard, pulled from bottomless wells of past triumphs, hurts, dreams, realized and deferred. Our voices lift, spirits lost, in middle passage crossings, pass me not so gently over waters, through rivers flow, Gambia, Niger, Osun, endless waters of the Ethiopian Atlantic Ocean, to muddy tributaries leading to the Mississippi, 
collective voices of 12 million people didn't call what was sung slave songs. Sounds came from belly deep places and African cultural memory spanning 400 years and a delayed emancipation before voices lift in cries of freedom. Up above and below and all around is music black, is soul, is blues, is gospel, is jazz, beat, is reggae and rap around, hip hop spirituals, is doo wop, ring shout, chants, and hollers. It is our music black that reaches beyond the great migration came to up south to Harlem or Chicago or Detroit to storefront churches and side street juke joints where we listen to a Duke Ellington swing to Bessie Smith and Billie Holiday singing blue notes to Muddy Waters sitting in the backyard next to Mahalia Jackson. With music, everything is possible. Who wouldn't sell all they had, including their soul, like Robert Johnson, for a chance to riff like Armstrong, Aretha, or Marsalis, to be loud with James Brown or Richard, little or small, would at the end of any day listen to message makers Mayfield, Marley, and Stevie, how the world evolves around that wonder. You ever be singing Sarah, Nina, Leotine, Erica Badu all bring tears to our eyes when they amplify songs. Black voices be love for all ages, be John and Alice Coltrane, King Cole, Nat and Natalie, family reunions, barbecues, Sunday dinners at Big Mama's and Big Papa's house. Be Alicia, Keys, and Swiss Bees, Common, Luther, Beyonce, and Jay-Z. Be the sway of a young black mother rocking and singing her brown baby to sleep. There is no one song, no one way. All is black and all leads us back to ancient rhythms and tongues we now recognize as home. The second layer of our music cake is hip hop, cosine. He is a music producer and hip hop artist. He's also a multi-talented wonder who's really been spreading his wings. Since 2018, he has worked on a soundtrack for the television series, Empire. He's also debuted as an actor and star. And last year, he produced a major commercial for the Joe Biden presidential campaign. He also helped the Music Cares COVID-19 project raise funds. For that project, he collaborated with Idris Elba on the song Kings, which he shared with us for purposes today. Enjoy. Hello there. Mi nombre es Marcos Enrique Palacios, AKA Cosign. And shout out to the Vivian G. Harsh Society. Uh, it is time for some black music celebration and um just a few words uh as far as what black music month means to me um it's very simple it means everything um music is what i've chosen to dedicate my life to um my mom started me off at piano at about six started playing saxophone in fifth grade drums in eighth grade uh, choir throughout high school and singing in different bands and so forth and so on. So um, music has just been 100% uh, what I've given my life to. Um, quiet down here, laptop. Uh, it's a gift from the most high, so I'm super grateful. 
uh, and music is also a universal language. So, you know, there are people in other countries that can hear your song and sing the words and love it and not even speak English because again, it's a universal language. Um, also, you know, from a, from a statistical standpoint, right? In the first half of 2020, uh, the U.S. recorded music revenues grew 5.6% to what? $5.7 billion. So the music industry is still very lucrative. And guess what? Hip hop is the number one genre in the world. And guess what that is? Black music. Um, it's our culture. You know, a, a lot of us were brought to this country against our will and music is how we got through. You know, when you listen to music and you hear people talk about soul music, what is that? You know, that's because we didn't been through something. Um, it's also how we express love. You know, it's how we celebrate birthdays, right? What, what if Stevie never just sat down and said, happy birthday to you? What if Stevie never did that, man? Can you imagine? Um, so, you know, I ask during Black Music Month and beyond that you take the time to truly support Black artists. Um, buy some merch, go to the concerts. You know, also parents, teach your kids. You know, grandparents teach your grandkids. Say, you don't know nothing about this. You don't know nothing about no Marvin Gaye. You understand? No Sam Cooke. You understand? No no Teddy Pendergrass. You understand? Share that music. Teach and celebrate Black music. Support Black artists. You know, Black artists are pop artists. That's us. We're popular. We got this. With that being said, I'm sending love and light to you all. Again, Cosign here. Checking out. Love. There is strength in numbers. So as we close this out, this is especially to my father, the late Teodoro Palacios Flores, to my sons, Marcos Enrique Palacios Jr. and young Azar Kings. <laughs> are falling every day and kings are rising just the same but when will we know who we are I see a light you are my stars blessed are those who make it home to know that you're never alone And know that it's okay to cry Can't get no better in my eyes yeah. We worry about so many things I'm not concerned with I don't want nothing from these people less I deserve it I'm tired of playing a Clown up in the circus You ask some respect up on your name You gotta earn it When you feel down and you out You gotta keep working Whole time I promise you You living right in your purpose The negative energy that's coming You gotta curve it Encourage yourself Then you slide just like it's cursive Oh, kings are falling every day And kings are rising just the same Ever been so pressured and 
prevalent where kingship is more relevant and the stories that we tell are a testament to those who we are and who we should become. My dad's name is one of my son's names and two kings share my soul, two heart beating, one blood and one throne. If you're a king then you know, you are a king you should know. Kings are falling. so much thank you so much today. My name is Gail Mitchell and I'm here with Monica Stewart, Monica Faith Stewart, uh, in this wonderful Black Music Month celebration. Uh, thank you for joining us today again and uh, we would like to make an appeal to you to donate to the Viv Vivian G. Harsh Society. Uh, your donation supports programs like these as well as supporting continuous support of the Vivian G. Harsh Research Collection of Afro-American History and Literature. And you know, Vivian Harsh is devoted to preserving African-American history and African-American literature. And when we talk about Black Lives Matter, yes, our lives matter, but we have to re-give it value. We have to record what it is we say we do how we have lived, what we thought about, what happened during our lifetimes. That's important. And because Black Lives Matter, Vivian Harsh, she knew it mattered. And she started documenting our experiences. And Gail, I was thinking, that's why we all need to support Vivian Harsh. Absolutely. I think we really need to support the, the Vivian GR Society because we're making and making sure that Black history stays alive for future generations. And with your generous support, uh, it's tax deductible. And uh, if you just click on the donate button below the screen, uh, you can donate that way. And if you click as a special gift on the $100 donation button, we have a special gift. Uh, a Chicago Defender photo of Vivian G. Harsh uh, at the helm of the George Cleveland Hall Branch Library on opening day back in 1932. So this is a historic photo. I mean, you won't, this is in the collection, by the way. Uh, it's a, a nice photo to have. You're, it's a piece of history that you're actually getting. And the producer is going to put up the um, photo for you, the image in just a second, so you can see this beautiful photo that we have as a gift for donating $100 or more. Uh, click on the $100 button below the stream, and uh, you'll get a piece of history just for, and as a token of our appreciation. And that alone is worth 100 bucks at least. But it also is a mark of your support and your esteem for, for the black experience. 
it's also your way of saying, yep, I know our Black Lives Matter. And we at the Vivian Heart Society are working hard to make certain that this collection lives on. It's um, at one time, I'm, I'm sorry to say, this collection fell into disrepair and it took a group of black activists, black academics and, and people who of consciousness to insist that we invest the resources necessary to preserve this history. Yes. So support us. Okay, and here comes the image that the producer's putting it up there right now. This lovely photograph is from the Chicago Defender back in January 1932. This is a historic photo because this is the day that Vivian G. Harsh opened, or the Chicago Public Library opened in Bronzeville. And this is where the Vivian G. Harsh research collection began. She started collecting mm -hmm. pamphlets, books, pictures, documents, all of this. She had literary greats coming through the doors. Imagine going to your local library to see Gwendolyn Brooks or Langston Hughes. That is unheard of. Mm -hmm. And you know, one of our icons today is Timuel D. Black who is 102 years young. Now, believe it or not, or Tim was actually a child who visited the George Cleveland Hall Library. And if you ask him, Tim, tell me about Vivian Harsh. Tim says, Vivian Harsh was harsh. She was serious about her library. So you didn't bring, little Timmy did not bring any nonsense into that library. She let him know that this was an important place for serious business and he had to conduct himself likewise. But look, he went on to chronicle the, the black experience in, in the sacred ground of Bronzeville. Yes. And your contribution will help make these kind of collections available to scholars and also students from the public schools who need to know here is this is these are this is our community and these are the people that I come from. Yes. So donate today. It's, and we'll love you uh, forever. Yeah, so donate today. And yes, don't forget to put, to, here's the photo, the lovely photo that you will get for, with your donation of $100 or more. It's tax deductible. Your generous gift will be very much appreciated. And you will own a piece of history as a token of our appreciation. So thank you. And Thanks. We, we hope to uh, continue with the program. Uh, the next person. Yes, the next person we're going to be doing is uh, St. Carl Hunter, correct? That's right. We're going to now look at the third layer of this music cake, and that is gospel music, the tradition of the Black church. And Sankara Haruna is just a marvelous voice. He is now mainly operating, mainly focusing on opera. He's classically trained, but he's got, a, 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 obviously, his roots are in the spirituals. His roots are in gospel music, R&B, jazz. And he brings all of this into expression through gospel music. He is from Chicago. He lives now in Fort Ford, Kentucky. And he has performed with the Kentucky Opera and the Cincinnati Opera. And we're sure one day he'll be here with the Lyric Opera. This summer, he will return to Cincinnati to play, to be part of the Barber of Seville. And a little later, he will be performing, he will be performing the gospel song, Witness, after first testifying about his take on the power of Black music.
Growing up in Chicago has afforded me with some of the greatest experiences musically. Whether if it's attending one of the many music festivals, going to community events around town, or simply going to church. Music has been at the forefront of my life. And for many people, music is one of the most natural, organic, and therapeutic aspects of life. But there has always been something special about being immersed in the Black experience of it all. Black music has essentially shaped our society and the way we view music. It's so powerful, it can make the calmest person tap their foot, pat their leg, and even bust a move. This is the power of black music. It invokes us to change and forces us to become a better version of ourselves. The music is a cry out of our humanity and becomes relatable to society as we know it. Our music is a true expression of ourselves and who we are. The psalmist her said it perfectly pertaining to her new album, Back of My Mind, I love her and her music, so let me paraphrase just a little bit. And if she sees this, holla at me and let's grow. Our music is honest. It's about love. It's about gratitude and being thankful for the now. Grateful for where I am standing. Grateful for who I am. And grateful for who I am becoming. Being able to smell the roses and actively live in the moment. Not in a carefree or lackadaisical way, but in a way that is more focused and deliberate. This is one of the things I love about us and our music. It gives us room for parallel thinking. I found myself far too often pondering this very subject. Our music and artistry allows us to bask in our vulnerabilities and to truly express who we are. Far too often we are forced to be in a bubble or fit into someone else's image of what we ought to be and who we ought to be. Our music is free expression, free of condemnation. It is truly pure freedom, something the vast majority may never know. It's not about validation, but it's about confirmation. Music is the brick and mortar of our culture. It's embedded so far in our DNA. So far, it tends to come off as second nature. But even understanding our gift from God is second nature, we recognize there is still a standard of musical excellence. Our music calls us to become something greater than ourselves. We are the originators of so many things, so how can we live a life anything less than great. We are filling the shoes of legends as well as breaking new ground for the next generation of artists all at the same time. One of the greatest reasons I love gospel music is that it is an expression of our identity, of our identity in the toughest of times. A solid majority of our music has come through at some time of turmoil or crisis, especially when we look at the African-American spirituals birthed out of slavery, the predecessor of how we see gospel music today. There was a time when all we had was the black church. It was the foundation of how we lived. These songs, culture, and atmosphere allowed us to not only regain our God-given power, but to define ourselves as we see fit. This is our story, and it shall be and will be told by us. That is the true power behind our music. Black gospel music is a culmination of all things, whether if it's jazz, blues, hip-hop, and even country. Our music gives us the charge to use all things to give glory to God. I stand by the statement that the greatest musicians come out of the black church, but I digress. Black music empowers us. Black gospel music empowers us to become something greater than ourselves 
while all at the same time giving honor and reverence to God. And God is the source of our power. And our fourth and foundation layer of our black music cake is jazz. Audley L. Reed, known to most as Reed, began this musical odyssey 25 years ago. As I mentioned, believe it or not, he's proficient on all the saxes but he loves the alto sax. His genius is often compared to David Sanborn or, and the late art, great Art Porter Jr. Now let's hear Audley talk about the power of jazz and then perform Horace Silver's song for my father. Hi, my name is Audley Reed, and I'm a saxophonist currently living in Chicago, Illinois. I'm here to tell you about my feelings about Black Music Month and what music means to me. As being a musician, I had the opportunity to travel all over the world, interface with various, various people. And one of the things that I walked away with is that music is the common tonality between cultures. It speaks multiple languages. All you have to do is play and touch the people. And that's what black music has done across the globe for centuries. If we go back and we look at the times when some of our forefathers came over, um, back through the slavery times, back through the civil rights movement, and even today with Black Lives Matter, music has been the corresponding founding foundation for our struggles. And so with that, I would like to say, continue to push forward, continue to create great music as we celebrate Black Music Month. Take care.
joining us for this powerful hour of Black music, poetry, and conversation. Uh, you've heard from four different performers today. All of them are uh, local, started off locally, and have branched out to other parts of the country. Um, and it's a beautiful thing to have local talent, upcoming talent, showcased and spotlighted in an event such as this. Uh, and again, it's not too late to support the Vivian G. Harsh Society. Uh, again, you can click on the donate button uh, right underneath the, the stream, underneath the stream uh, window, and you can do that. And we have a special gift again for you for your $100 donation. And again, by clicking the $100 donate uh, button down below, uh, we have a special gift. And I forgot to mention, thank you to Maidi Senstack for allowing us permission to give this piece of history to you for your $100 gift which is a Chicago Defender photo of Vivian Harsh at the Cleveland Branch Library in Bronzeville. This photograph was taken on opening day, opening day January 1932. This was a, a big moment in Black history. This was a library branch that was built for the community, sponsored by uh, Julius Rosenwald. He gave the funds to help build this. So this was a library that was right there in the heart of Bronzeville. So this is a moment in history that you'll never get another chance to get to have again. So please, with your $100 donation, your generous tax deductible donation, you will get a print of Vivian Harsh herself at the George Cleveland Hall Branch Library. So please support us. And there's uh, the picture right there. So please support us. And this is a 16 by 20 inch photograph. So this is perfect for framing, putting on your fireplace, putting on your walls in your home uh, or your office. Uh, it's a beautiful photo and it's a limited edition print. Each one will be numbered. So we will have uh, a piece of history uh, added to it and value added to it as well. So again, whatever you can give, is very much appreciated, but know that your dollars are helping to keep Black history alive for all of us. So don't forget also, we have another added bonus. We have playlists on Apple Music and Spotify, the Vivian G. Harsh Power of Black Music playlist. There for your listening enjoyment to get you in the mood for celebrating Black music uh, from now in June and throughout the year. There's uh, music from our performers today, as well as our uh, anthems, classic anthems from the Black music experience. It's a collection of songs from all of this. So thank you for joining us.